Grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. First Thessalonians, 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. First Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. God, speak through me and to me that your words would permeate and saturate, satiate, that would encompass and totally engulf my being that ultimately your word would be the prevailing theme of today. And even beyond that, God, that your glory would be revealed in such a magnificent way that the power of your might would be manifested and that how we would hear, how we would speak, how we would approach even the throne of grace would be different. Let us be effective in you. Let us see the efficacy of you in our situations. Let your power permeate every single dynamic of our lives and you and you alone get the glory I do not take anything from you God but it's your moment you set it up these are your people now have your way in Jesus name amen first Thessalonians the fifth chapter verses 16 through 18 when you found it say amen I was in the office a minute ago and I was, I was telling Pastor Gaywood I said, Pastor Gaywood, I just feel so unprepared today. I don't know what's wrong. I'm nervous. Uh, and, you know, typically, uh, he always has the right thing to say. You know you, 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 you know, you love people like that and you can't stand them at the same time. So, <laughs> I said, I don't know what it is. I said, I feel just so unprepared today. I mean, I'm prepared. And I sat there and I went through my whole sermon with him. And he was like, you just did it. I said, yeah, but I still feel unprepared. <laughs> and he says, well, in your weakness. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. I acted like I didn't even hear him. I just went on in the conversation. <laughs> Isn't that the amazing thing about God? When you feel ill-equipped and unprepared, God's spirit will kick in and he will do the work. As a matter of fact, he needs you to get out of his way so that he can do what he needs to do in this place. So tell your neighbor, it's going to be all right. Yeah, it's going to be all right. First Thessalonians 5th chapter, verses 16 through 18. Help Jesus. It says, Receive, rejoice evermore. And I want to pay a special attention and hang my hat on this, uh, maybe our hopes even on this, because this is the, the catalyst, this is the key. Verse 17 says what? Come on, say it with me. Pray. As a matter of fact, let's back up and let me let you read. I feel better if you participate. Verse 16, let's read it again. It says, rejoice evermore. Pray in everything for this is the will of God okay one more time for everybody say rejoice evermore come on say it with me rejoice evermore pray give thanks for this is the will of God And I'm hanging my hat and shining my son up sermonic spotlight on verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. God, get the glory. You set it up. Now have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the incredible presence of God. Jabbar, give me a little bit more here. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. For those of you who do not already know and you have not been a part of what we've been experiencing all month long, we're in a new series simply called Connect Four. I was so grateful, so excited to see some of you participating with the Connect Four games out in the lobby. Do we have a champion named yet? Have we had the tournament yet or uh, any of our, our Connect Four gurus in the building? If you're a Connect Four champ, just let me see your hand. Oh, I see you. I see you. Let's see, we're going to have to put one on stage so you can play the past and we can see it. <laughs> but I am so, ex I'm so excited that you've embraced the concept 
but of course now you know by well by now you know and if you don't let me make sure I inform you that connect four was simply the catalyst that was used or the vehicle that I used the tool that I used to make sure that we understand these four dynamic ways to connect with Jesus Christ Needless to say, there are many other ways. Now, make sure that you understand there is only one way, and that is Jesus Christ himself. But there are many facets of how that is manifested in in, in our efforts to connect with Christ. However, there are four which I consider primary principle, foundational, fundamental for anybody that needs to connect with Jesus. I learned this and I continue to say this and I will perpetually say this from now until because I just believe that it is the experience of people that there there are a lot of people who know of Jesus but not a lot of people who know Jesus. That, that unfortunately is the experience and exposure of mankind and most of us have, have people around us who uh, they, they will testify that they know of. The Bible says something like, the Bible says something like this. <laughs> That's a clear indication that you know of him, but you don't necessarily know him. Uh, you know, or they will misquote scripture like, you know, um, you know, cleanliness is next to godless, you know, like the Bible says. No, it doesn't. Where did you get that? Show that to me in the book. You know, there are so many of those dynamics and so many things that manifest in our conversation where we find that people know of him, but they don't really know him. And the only way that you know him, as was given to us last week with Pastor Gatewood and Pastor Tim on this campus, uh, they did a spectacular, phenomenal job at God allowing them to be used in this place. Yeah, we celebrate them. But as they gave us on last week, the only way to really know Christ is to know his word. And I'll give you indication even later as to why. I promise you, this is going to be a very in-depth study. I got to make a case. I got to argue today. And so if you prepare your mind and your heart to receive, I want to show you uh, another way to connect with Jesus Christ. The first way, of course... Uh, that we connect with Christ and I know this was the one that probably took a lot of people off guard and I've gotten emails and text messages and phone calls and and, and people revisiting their uh, attendance policy and people coming back to the fellowship because they realize they've been disjointed they've been dysfunctional and they have been disfellowshipped not by us but by them own, their own decision or their own them, their own selves and so I want to make sure that you understand fellowship is a priority it is a passion it is a prerequisite to connecting with Jesus Christ you cannot connect with Christ if you do not want to be connected with his people let that sit for a second and for those of you who missed that message go back I promise you want to do your heart your life a favor and make sure you see that first sermon or go watch that first sermon the second thing which was last week is that there is no connection with Christ without connecting with the word because the word of God is God. So you have to know uh, that, that that is a prerequisite, a priority, and again, a fundamental foundation for connecting with Jesus. But today, I'm going to take you a step further. And I want to push this issue even further today because uh, connecting with people is one facet. Connecting with God's truth is the most foundational, important facet. But I want to connect with Jesus, and one of the ways that I connect with him is also through prayer. The way that you connect with people is through conversation. You don't really know a person until you hear them speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, what the mouth speaks. So I don't really know who you are until I hear what you have inside. That's why when you started talking with your boo and your babe, Think back, it may be in a while, but think back. One of the things that you did on a continual basis is that you spent a lot of time talking on the phone. You were dialoguing. You just had conversation. And sometimes the conversation was shallow. Sometimes it may have been in-depth. Sometimes it was just you listening to each other breathe. What you doing? Nothing. What you doing? Nothing. Ten minutes later, what you doing? Same nothing. Or you walk around in the store and you're doing everything that you're doing and they're on the phone and you even forget they're on the phone because you got the phone in your ear so long. 
So some of the ways that you connect with people, one of the main ways that rather you connect with people is that you have to have conversation. You have to have communication. There has to be the articulation of your heart, which is only going to happen through your mouth. And so when you articulate what is going on inside and you allow it to come through your mouth, then it hits the ears and the auditory nerves take it to the brain and then it compiles this file of who this individual is and basically you get to know them over a course of time. The more you talk, the more you communicate the better you know them. It works exactly the same way into the, in the kingdom. The more you talk to Jesus, the more you know him. The more you communicate with him, the more you get to know who he is and what it is that he desires for you to know about him. Now, here's the thing. It's a catch. It's catch-22 in this particular situation because when you're talking to people, you're trying to get to know one another, meaning you don't know them and they don't know you. But it's different when you're talking to God. Because when you talk to God, he already knows you. You just don't know him. So the challenge is that, you know, God is already aware before you open your mouth, but he desires to be in fellowship with you. He desires communion with you to such a degree that he would send his son to die to yet again create the connection of fellowship between God and his creation. And so his desire is so impassioned that he is connected to you because he wants not just for it to be the ritual, but he wants it to be relational. I don't know how you feel about it, but it makes me excited to know that God wants to be in relationship with me. This great God we serve desires to be in relationship with me. That's why the scripture says, who am I that thou art mindful of me? That the son of man would even take the time to sit down and want to visit with me. I'm a wretch undone. I'm nobody. I'm the least, the last, the lost. I'm unworthy to even gather the crumbs beneath your table and you still call me friend. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good about God. There were songs when we were growing up that talked about this, you know, um, I don't know how, who, would, who would remember this as an old hymn, but uh, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. Hear our faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer will turn and know a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it all right. Woo! I didn't sing it because I felt like I'd start something I couldn't finish. But songs like that spoke of the relational dynamic between God and his people. It's also a method and a mechanism by which we connect with Christ. Uh, and I'll give you, a good, again, I'll give you further evidence of that. But I want to make sure that we understand a key way to connect with Christ is through prayer. Somebody say prayer. prayer. A key way to connect with Christ is not just the songs that we used to sing, but it really is a legitimate way to connect with Christ. And it's through prayer. So here it is. Prayer, first of all, is commanded by God. I forgot to give you this backdrop. If I don't give you this historical context, if I don't give you the foundation or, or give you uh, the, the context in general, you're going to miss the whole content. And so I want to make sure that we understand prayer is not uh, an option. It is a commandment of God. In Luke 18 and 1, it says, and he spake, Jesus said, and, and he spake this parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not faint. Men ought to always, how, how long is always? Okay, y'all so smart, I couldn't get it over on you all. Always pray, prayer is commanded. Not only is it commanded, watch this, but prayer is also commended. In John 14, 13 and 14, it says, And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's so commendable. God says, I'm going to give you the proxy of my power. I'm going to give you access to my character. I'm going to give you access to me in such a magnanimous way that it's going to result in the, uh, in the manifestation of what you requested because you requested it in my name. If that's not a commendation, 
that God would give you exactly what you prayed for because you prayed in the right character. Now, let me qualify. This is another teachable moment. I'm going to have many before I'm done, but this teachable moment, let me make sure you understand that when, you say, when it says that in the scriptural text, it's not talking about you using the letters of his name. You know, there are some that would say you cannot use the name Jesus. There are some religious sects. There are some traditions that will not let you use his name proper. They say you must call him Yeshua. They say you must call him I am. You must call him anything but this. We're not to speak the name of Jesus. And I, that's not my tradition. That's not my foundation. That's not my upbringing, my teaching, my training. That's not my truth. I believe that when the scripture says that we ask in his name, it means ask in his name. But let me be clear, it is not the proper name that we are used to seeing that gives power to that hope act. Please understand that what you're doing essentially is you're asking in the character of Jesus. You're asking based upon the character of his name or his person, which is embodied in his name. Are y'all with me? Okay, lean in. This is going to get a little deep right here. So please understand that if you ask in his name, but you do not ask in the character of the person who stands behind the name, you are going to miss the mark and your prayers will not have efficacy or power. They will not be manifested. You will not see the result. And you've been praying uh, in, in, in ways that have been taught to you, but you've not been praying in ways that are taught by Jesus' truth. Okay. If I go to the bank and I tell them, listen, Pastor Eugene Gatewood sent me here and told me to get his money out of the bank. I'm asking in his name. But I'm not asking in the character of the person who is behind the name. Well, how do I know that you're asking in his name? Because I used his name. I invoked his name. I said his name. Pastor Gaywood said, you all are supposed to give me his money out of the bank. But if I show up with a contract which says that I now have legal rights to Pastor Gatewood's name, I now have a character witness or character content that gives me, watch this, power of attorney over his affairs, then they will honor what I have said and they will give it to me by the basis of his name or the character of the person behind the name whose signature is affixed that lets me use his name. Are you with me? So when you show up and just say Jesus, it does not have. Why do you think that the, the disciples, when they could not cast out the demonic possessed little boy, Jesus shows up and says, oh my God, how long am I going to have to put up with you? Oh, ye of little faith. They were using his name. They even asked after that, why didn't it work for us, but it worked for you? And so he says, these kind only come out by prayer and fasting. He essentially was teaching them that this is the characteristic of me that you're going to have to learn in order to see the kind of power or outcome that you see when I step into the equation. Are you with me? So what you have to know is that it's more than just you saying the name. You have to be in relationship or have a contract or a covenant with the person behind the name. And that's what gives his name power. And that's what causes the commendation of the manifestation of what you ask for. Okay. I told you it's going to be one of these days today, so just rock with me. I promise we're going to get there. So prayer is commanded, but prayer is also commended. The challenge with us is that we have been asking in the name, but we haven't had a contract or a covenant with the relation or a relationship with the person whose name it is. Not only was it commanded, not only was it commended, but Jesus committed to prayer. Jesus commanded it, Jesus commended it, and he committed to it himself. In Luke 3 and 21, Jesus prayed at his own baptism. In Luke 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, get away from the crowd, drown out the noise so he could talk to God himself. 
In Matthew 14, after he had dismissed them, he went away to the multitude by himself. And again, you find Jesus praying. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before they came to arrest him. Until blood and sweat drew down his face. John 17, the entire chapter is called the high priestly prayer uh, or a high priestly prayer where Jesus prays for himself, then he prays for his disciples, then he prays for all believers. In Matthew 11 and in Luke 10, Jesus prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. I'm only giving you all of this and I'm throwing at you real fast, I know. Uh, but I'm only giving you all of this because I want you to see that there is evidence that Jesus not only commanded it, not only did he uh, commend it, but he also committed himself to it. So if we're going to be connected with Christ, we have to actually have a relationship with him. And we have to understand that because he is both Lord and Savior. Most of us know him as Savior, but don't know him as Lord. To know him as Savior means that you have received the sacrifice and you are now a part of the kingdom of God. But to know him as Lord means that you have also submitted to him and you're going to follow his example or his model and do as he has done. So when you follow his example, when you follow his model, if he is actually your Lord, he has already told you, I commanded you to pray, I commended you for prayer, and I promised if you prayed in the right tone, the right perspective, the right heart, I would honor your prayers, and I have committed myself to prayer. What else do I have to do to show you that this is a requirement, a prerequisite, this is a priority in order for you to remain in connection or relationship with me? me okay the reason that many people have not understood this dynamic is because we haven't followed the model that was given to us by Jesus himself how do I connect with him I connect with him through prayer I connect with him through conversation through communication through relational interaction with him and Jesus says the disciples asked him actually they said Lord teach us how to pray and he says, okay, I'm glad you asked. I'll show you. You pray like this. Somebody say, like, like this. this. One more time. Like, like this. this. Now, nowhere in the text did he say, pray this. He said, pray like this. Are y'all praying now? Because this is about to be something different. So, so understand that what Jesus gave us was a template. He did not give us the prayer, but he gave us a model of prayer. That's why he said pray like this. But we have for so many years taken on ownership of knowing the Lord's prayer in repetition, knowing it in rehearsed memory, knowing it in articulating it based upon writ and not on context, we have taken this and we feel that this is a powerful opportunity for us to connect with Jesus Christ or connect with God. The problem is God doesn't respond to the template. Okay, I'll give it to you like this. When you go into your computer and you look at Microsoft Word, there are templates. If you click on a template for, for a memo or click on a template for, um, let's say you click on the template for a, 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 a newsletter and you complete the newsletter or you rather take the newsletter template and you send it to somebody, what are they going to say? What is this? If you simply just grab a template of something, somebody gives you a form, and it's a template of a form, but there's no information, no details, nothing explicitly written within it that gives content and context, and they send it out to somebody, what are they going to ask when you send it to them? They're going to look at it, and they're going to say, what is this? Because it's not going to have any meaning. It's not going to have any valid and valuable content. Well, when you pray simply the template and you send it to God, God is saying, what is this? Uh, so technically, 
We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it is not the Lord's Prayer. It is the model prayer given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Are you with me? And even if we were going to put a name and, and, and actually call it according to what it really is, it's really the disciples' prayer template. Because he says, pray like this. So here's what happens. We want to connect with Jesus. And prayer is by all means a priority way for connecting with Jesus. Of course, there's the word, there is fellowship with people, but prayer is a priority in the kingdom. It is a command. It has been commended, and Jesus himself committed himself to it. And why would Jesus commit to something that was not prerequisite? And remember how he and why he even showed up was to model for us how we are supposed to live. That's why he was tempted in every way on every occasion so that he could show us what overcoming looks like. And so he gave us this example. He showed us how to do this. The challenge is we have not yet understood how to do it. So because of that, we've been doing it, but we have not been seeing the manifestation or we've not been seeing the fulfillment of what it is that we prayed for. And then we become cynical because we get mad because God didn't do what he said he was going to do. But God didn't do what he said he was going to do, perhaps because it's not his will. He is not subject to his will bending to our wants. Because at the end of it, it still works for your good, even if it doesn't go along with your wants, but it lines up with his will. And we know that how many things? All. All things. So here's the other thing. It's not only that, it may not be his will, but it may be how we are actually praying. Because we don't understand how to pray. So I'll never connect with Christ if I don't know how to pray. I'll never connect with God if I don't know how to pray. Okay. If you take prayer out of the context of kingdom, you then minimize your efficacy or your effectiveness in prayer and you now disqualify your capacity to see what God has already said. Are you with me? It's real quiet right through here. Okay, walk with me. In understanding prayer, we must first understand our position in prayer. We are kingdom citizens. Okay? The moment that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We live here. We're subject to the rules and the laws here according to the word of God. But we are not subject to the authority of, the, of this world over and against the authority of the divine. Okay, here it is. Let me give you in real life practical terms. The doctors give you the laws of medicine. But because we're kingdom citizens, we have access to the laws of heaven. Which say, he was wounded, he was bruised, our chastisement is upon him, of our pieces upon him, and by his stripes we will see healing. Okay, in this world we're subject to the laws of the economy. But in the kingdom, we're subject to the laws of heaven, which means that God still, in spite of the economy of this world, he's still in the blessing business or he still will supply all of our needs not according to the economy of our bank account here, but according to the economy of heaven, which is limitless, which is boundless, which is plenty, and which is enough. So you see how it works, right? We are kingdom citizens. The moment you join the body of Jesus Christ, the moment you tell God, I repent of my sins and I want to be saved, at that moment you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. The problem with us, however, is that we don't see ourselves as citizens of a kingdom. We don't even think kingdom. We think church, we think world, 
we think planet, we think earth, but we do not think kingdom. We think denomination, we think religion, but we do not think kingdom. So whenever you have a kingdom, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in context, if you have a kingdom on earth, that kingdom is governed by a political system. And at the head of a kingdom is what? The king. So the king has authority and the king has charge of everything and everybody within their kingdom. So when we became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, when we became a citizen of the kingdom of God, we now are subject to the authority or the authoritative governance of a, a, a kingdom which is led by the king. Well, who's the king of all kings? And who is the Lord of all lords? Jesus himself, right? Okay. So when you take prayer, which is your way of connecting with Jesus, Outside of the context of the kingdom, you then, rem you then make it a religious act and not a kingdom principle. Okay. Praying emotionally and not effectively is because you've taken the entire concept of prayer out of the kingdom and you have made it a religious action. Just because you have passion does not mean you have power. And the only reason that you have minimized your efficacy or your effectiveness in prayer is because you think that it is based upon your emotion or your passion and not based on the principles and the processes, watch this, of a government called the kingdom of God. The disciples, read the scripture record for yourself, they called him the Messiah. The word Messiah literally means king. It is not a religious word. It is a political word. We don't think of it in the terms of politics or government. We think of it in the terms of religion and church. But the king is part of a government. They, they say, thou art the Christ. The word Christ means anointed king. So you don't come to a king and try to manipulate with emotion or con him with, with, with your passion or your tears or being enthralled in an emotional capacity. You come to a king and you use the rules or the laws of the government to appeal to their righteous judgment. A king is a part of a government that has a legal proceeding or process. It has boundaries, it has processes, it has rules, it has regulations, it has principles, it has precepts, it has laws. This is where I'm going to really challenge you. Because the Bible is not a devotional book. Now y'all see why I had to pray. Because I am really uprooting the foundation of many of your upbringing. The Bible is not a devotional book. It is a book that is composed of two separate divisions of covenants or laws, which we call testaments. You have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. The Old Testament, the New Testament, a testament is a legal term. A testament is an agreement or a legal document. When you have a, let me help you, let me help you see it. Last will and it's a legal contract. It is a legal document. So the Bible is a legal document. 
It is a document that is comprised of the old contract and the new contract. When a lawyer brings someone into court and asks them to testify on your behalf, they are called a what? Witness. And a witness testifies in a courtroom. They bear witness to the testament or the, the circumstantial situation that has been presented that they now bear witness to. In other words, they testify. Please hear me. Because I know you grew up with testimonial service. And you thought testimonial service was a religious dynamic or a religious action. But really to testify is a legal term for a courtroom. It is not a religious word, it's a legal terminology. When I testify, I am pleading my case. <sighs> We've heard it, I plead the blood, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. But we don't even realize what we're actually doing is we're making a pleading which is a legal term. But because we've taken prayer outside of the context of kingdom and we've now made it a religious action, we think that the kingdom principles are to be put into our religiosity when it should be that your religiosity needs to bow down to the kingdom principles. There is no testimony in religion. It is only in a courtroom because it has to do with testament. And a testament is a legal document that makes a case or establishes a covenant. And based on the legal document with laws that are already promised to me, I have rights or I have justice or I have righteousness. So here's the problem. You've been praying from a perspective that is religious, but it is not kingdom. It doesn't matter how much you talk. If you don't follow proper procedure, the judge will dismiss your case. Okay. One of the worst things you can do, I grew up watching Matlock. I don't know how many of y'all, I, I didn't miss one episode every day. I'm going to watch Matlock. Matlock was cold. He would be just as unassuming. And well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, I t tell me, I'm trying to understand. He would be wearing them out. But one of the one of the episodes that I remember is when 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 the lawyer came in and they were unprepared and they didn't have all the facts. They didn't have all the well. The the, the judge immediately says, "Listen, you should have been better prepared for this case dismissed." So if we have these two testaments and we don't understand the laws or not familiar with the principles or even the process that is contained in this old and this new testament, if we don't have the covenants or the contract of these dynamics in our heart, in our head, and it doesn't come out of our mouths and we don't allow our process or our procedure to be followed and we then go and make a petition to God because a petition, again, a legal terminology, when we make a petition to God, when we make a petition before God and we don't have all of our procedure or our process in place because we didn't follow the covenants or we don't know the testaments or we haven't used the testament then God looks at your prayer and says what case dismissed go figure out how to do this then come back and holler at me it doesn't matter how much emotion and passion you are going to express when you pray God understands testament your God, you petition God with law. Most of us, we shy away from law because we're so in love with grace. But Jesus says, I didn't come to get rid of the law. I came to fulfill it. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to be fulfillment of it. 
But we are so in love with grace. Why are we so in love with grace? Because grace lets us sin and keep doing it again. You already planning your next, don't do it. So how is this connected to Jesus? Why is this interchanging? How does this connect me to Jesus? Well, because here's the thing. Every kingdom has a document of governance. The kingdom, uh, the, the, the kingdom of the United States has a document of governance. And it's called the what? Constitution of the United States. All the laws have to be in alignment or amendments have to be added to the what? Constitution of the United States. All the lawyers study through law school how to actually utilize, how to win a case using the laws or the Constitution of the United States. So, Jesus is the Constitution of the Kingdom of God. The problem is, you cannot connect with God unless you use the testaments, which are the laws or the covenants of the Bible. And Jesus is the Bible. In Jeremiah 1 and 12, the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Jesus is the word. So you can't go to God in prayer until you go to him using his own truth or himself. God fulfills himself. Here's what we do. God, I need a house, a car, I need this, I need that. We go and we ask all of these things on our Santa Claus wish list. And what we really need to do is reposition ourselves so that we're asking God to allow the kingdom of his governance to come on earth as it is already in heaven. Because if the kingdom of heaven is set up on earth, then all the things you could ask for are already in place. Jesus is the word. You're connecting with God through prayer, but the only way that you connect to God through prayer is that you use his word. Well, who is the word? Jesus. Say it with me again. Jesus. Jesus. There is no connection. I know this is a rehearsal of last week, but bear with me. I got to make this argument plain. There is no connection with Christ without the word because he is the word. The entire Bible, every story, every line, every precept is about Jesus Christ. The Bible contains so many figures and events that foreshadow or typify Jesus himself. Literally, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire book is about Jesus. Okay, bear with me. Y'all still with me? All right. Adam. In Romans 5 and 14, Paul refers to Adam as a type of the one who was to come, meaning Jesus Christ. Adam's role as the first man parallels Jesus Christ as the head of the new creation. That's why he is the second Adam. Melchizedek in Genesis, the 14th chapter, the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God, they, they, they make a parallel between Melchizedek and Jesus because he has no lineage, he has no beginning. And just as Jesus has no beginning, he also has no ending. And then Moses, Moses is seen as the deliverer in Deuteronomy 18. As a deliverer, he led the children of Israel out of their bondage and, and saved, allowed them to cross on dry land or cross into the land that was promised just as Jesus would come and lead all of the captives of sin free and lead them across all over into a, a territory, a promised land that we know to be heaven. Joseph is a type of Christ. In Genesis 37 through 50, it mirrors Christ in several ways because both were beloved by their father, both of them were betrayed for silver, both of them were falsely accused, and eventually both 
both of them would be exalted or be lifted into the place of being second in charge of the entire kingdom which is now Jesus seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty then there is David David is a type of Christ David's reign symbolizes the eternity of Christ promised through the lineage or bloodline he says I'll bless you through the loins of David well just like that Jesus comes and engrafts us into his family and from his loins or from the bloodline will come all the generations of people that will be blessed Jonah is a type of Christ when Jonah was swallowed up in the well he, he ascended into the bottom of the world and sat in the belly of a fish but watch this he was then spewed up and put back on the shore well Jesus descended into the pits of hell and he stayed there until the revival was completed and then he was let out on to dry I'm trying to help y'all see this thing the whole Bible is about Jesus Isaac Isaac is the greatest example of Jesus he is the greatest type of Jesus that would be foreshadowed that is in the book of the Bible Isaac was laid on an altar not as an infant but as a boy he was a teenage boy that crawled up and grabbed the horns of the altar and laid himself down to sacrifice because he trusted his father to always show up and do Jesus laid himself on the cross because he trusted that his father would not leave him and forsake him I'm trying to help y'all see it oh help Jesus the entire Bible is about who Jesus. it's about Jesus well, Pastor, all of those were Old Testament. Let me take you to the new then. <laughs> Y'all remember the fourth man in the fire in the book of Daniel, the third chapter? The King Nebuchadnezzar says, I see three. Wait a minute. I see four. And that fourth one looks like Jesus. Man of fallen from heaven. God is the bread. Rock of Herod. Uh, Horeb, he said, strike the rock and there'll be water that feeds all the people. Jesus says, I am the well. He that drinks from this well will never thirst again. The whole book. Sit down, sit down. I'm just teaching, sit down. The whole book is about who? Jesus. Jesus. So there is no connection to God without the testaments the problem is you've been using your words and not his and you haven't even been following procedure so there's no connection with God without the testaments and then there is no connection with the testaments without Jesus so one of the challenges that we have been confronted with is that we will pray and remain exactly where we are and then be flustered and frustrated because God ain't doing it but did you honor the testament did you follow protocol did you follow the procedure did you humble yourself did you do these things that are prerequisite to the promise have you even studied the law have you rightly why do you think the Bible says that we should rightly divide to divide means to get in and find deeper meaning and be able to utilize it. When a lawyer, can I, let me just tell, I'm going to tell myself for a second. I, as, as recently as two or three months ago, I just decided, and when, when I was in college, my whole goal was to go to law school. And about three months ago, I decided, I'm going to go to law school anyway. I did, I decided that. Don't clap. Mm -mm. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm. 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 And he woke up. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. So I called one of my best friends who was actually my line brother or my, my, and my, my classmate and my best friend from college. I called him and he's, a, he's one of my attorneys. 
I said, hey, man, I said, Brandon, I'm thinking about going to law school. He said, man, you should do it, man. I said, yeah, I know, because he and I were going together. We literally had the same classes and the same track on everything. We were going to go to law school together. We went and looked at all of them together. And uh, I went and pleaded a different case, and he pleaded another case. He was pleading the laws of this land. I was pleading the laws of the kingdom. But I decided I wanted to still accomplish the thing that I set out to do. So I called him and I said, hey, man, I, I'm thinking about it. He was really encouraging. He said, oh, yeah, you can do this. You need to take this test. You need to do that. I said, that's cool, man. And so then he sent me and he said, well, now, this is just what you got to know. You, you, you're only going to be able to do this. I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll probably be able to stay in your, in your church in Chicago. He said, but all these other ones that you plant around the country? He said, no, you ain't going to be able to do that while you're doing this. I said, I'm smoking off. You don't know who, you don't know who I am. <laughs> so he sent me a case and actually sent me the case law. And outlined, underlined, showed me the process, showed me what I would have to do and how the classes are. And he went through all of these things, constitutional law. And all, I mean, he gave me all this stuff. And so I sat down and I started reading. And then I was reading, and I was reading, and I was reading, and I was reading, and then I was reading. And then again, I was reading. I said, mm mm, get somebody else to do it. So I called him back. I said, man, I can't do all of this. this is, he said, no, that's just one case. We have to study all of this just for one case. One case, one class, one case. I said, wait a minute. You got to do all of this for every set. Yeah, and you have many cases throughout. The, you have to know case law. You have to go and study. And you, I said, wait, 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 wait. You mean you got to do all of this? That's like one assignment. He said, oh, no, no, that's not even the assignment. I said, oh, no, get somebody else to do it. I said, no, you're right. I'm not going to be able to do this in this season of my life. <laughs> Called my boys. I said, yeah, dad was getting ready to go to law school. But it, and they both said, dad, let us do it. We got it. <laughs> let us do it. One case. One case. You got one problem. And you won't even go and dig and rightly divide to find the answers, the procedures, the process, the promises that have been given to you in the Testament to deal with one case. You would rather cry. You would rather holler out. You would rather get emotional. And God is like, what is wrong with you, baby? <laughs> it's like a little baby that's crying and you don't know what's wrong. It's like, what is it? Because they don't have the words. That's how you look. He says, what is, what is wrong? Find the words that I have already given to you. And bring those back to me so that I can respond to myself. We think God responds to us. He does not. God responds to himself. The problem is you have not been using him or his words in order to reach God. So you're saying, I know Jesus, but you don't. You know of him, but you don't know him. So here's what my challenge is for you. You have to learn how to pray scripture. All the emotion in the world is not going to get you your prayers answered. You got to know how to pray. Now, let me be clear. In our context, in the context of, of, of our uh, culture, you know, I've been black all my life. I have never been anything else. But in the context of that, we are emotive people. We are emotional people. I don't take that from us. We are passionate people. We are passionate people. We dance hard. We cry hard. We laugh hard. We play hard. We are passionate. And I appreciate that. And I'm passionate. And I'm emotional. So I don't take anything from that. But all emotion with no truth. Let me say it again. All petition 
with no proceedings, all passion with no Jesus does not get you what you need to have from God. It's crazy because later in life, you know, well, I'm not later in life, but middle of life, the older I get, the less tolerance I have for shallow preaching and teaching. It's like, that ain't helping me. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. How? Let me get that how about you. Show it to me in that book. Show it to me. Show it to me. I mean, and, and again, I am a product of the traditions of the African-American culture and black preaching. I'm the product of it. I, I appreciate every single bit of it. I appreciate the eloquent, the art form. There is an art form. There is, there is, there is a, a systematic approach to doing all of these things. And I appreciate every bit of it. There is meaning. There is historical context from where it comes from. It's valuable, it's rich, it's depth is amazing to me. But what I learned is that none of that will matter if I do not have it positioned on the foundation of these testaments. My covenant, my contract is with God through his own promises. And the greatest promise he has given to all mankind is Jesus Christ who is the word made flesh and dwelt among us in the beginning was the word word was with God the word was God and Jesus is the word made flesh and he was sent to dwell among us that is the promise so the first step to connecting with God through prayer is Jesus this is going to challenge us. There's a lot of people who are praying, but their prayers are not being heard or answered. I did a lesson years ago here at Victory, uh, the prayers that God doesn't answer. Because despite popular opinion, God doesn't answer all prayers. He has conditions that must be met because they're a part of the legal proceeding. And then he will hear your prayer and he will answer your prayer. Then there's, of course, another facet that he answers sometimes and it doesn't give you the answer you want. But the first step and the first prerequisite is that you're in Christ Jesus because all of the people that are praying outside of the context of the kingdom, they're praying outside of the context of the legal proceeding. Your, your process is flawed. So your prayers are ineffective. The first prayer that God will hear from you, that he chooses to hear from you, is, Father, I repent and I receive your son as my savior. And then he gives you, he gives you uh, your spiritual social security number. He calls you a citizen of the kingdom and he writes your citizenship down in the book of life that he keeps on record and that we will all experience on the day of judgment we'll check to see if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life is your citizenship intact have you accepted my son as your savior because it's in that moment and he calls you his own. You are now a child of the father. You are now a child of the king. You are a king's kid. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. And I don't know about you, but there's no greater citizenship that I could have than to know that I'm a part of the kingdom of God. Come on, stand all over the building. Come on and bless God just for being who he is.
how to pray the scriptures, how to pray the scriptures. I don't want to leave you without this, how to pray the scriptures. I apologize, I forgot to tell you, but how to pray the scriptures. First of all, you need to select the scriptural passages that are relevant for the circumstance or the situation that you're dealing with. And it doesn't even have to be a problem or pain. But you select, and, and, and in your reading, because you're reading the word regularly, daily, <clears throat> in your reading, because you're reading it daily, God will deposit some things into your hearing, into your heart, into your head in that process. Here's what, here's what I do. This is what I'm suggesting for you. Categorize it. There's so many tools available now. Your cheat codes are amazing. There's this nifty thing called Google. Just make sure it is from the word of God and not a word. Amen. So many other tools that I'm going to give. I don't want to advertise for people, but because they didn't pay the church. But I, I it's, it's, so many other tools that are available to you. Research, find them. They're there. But find the passages that speak to. I had books. Now we don't sell books anymore. Everything's digital. But I have books from back when I had to carry a whole suitcase on the road with me just to study. But I have books that were compilations of everything the Bible says about this or this or this, whatever the situation. Select those passages. Now, here's the thing. Don't just select the passages and sit there and read the passage. I'm going to read this back to you, God. He said, I know what I said. But is it coming from here? Or is it just coming from here? So after you select the passage, read the passage for understanding. Are you with me? Pay attention to every word, every phrase. The Bible, the word, Jesus is alive. He will speak to you while you're reading and you'll get revelation and he'll tell you things about it that you've never seen. That's why you sit in service and you'll hear me quote scriptures and I'll show it to you and you'll say, oh my God, I've never seen that and I've read this a million times because he's alive. The Word of God is alive. It is quickened. Read the passage for understanding. The third thing is reflect on the passage. Spend some time with it. Take a moment and reflect on it, how it affects you personally, how it deals with your situation, how it deals with your circumstance, how it addresses your problem, how it deals with your challenges. Consider how it relates to your life, your struggles, your joys, your questions. What is God trying to say to me through these things? How does this passage apply to my situation? And then the next thing is respond in prayer. Express your thoughts and your feelings and your concerns in prayer using his word. Using his promise. I have a list of you said prayers. You said. <laughs> And I will go down that list and remind God, you said, according to the law or the covenant of the kingdom of God, you said. But be careful because those you said prayers will get you in trouble if you haven't done what you were supposed to do. Because he's an if then kind of God. If you do this, then I am faithful to do this. If you repent, I am faithful to forgive. If you bring the whole time, I am faithful to open up the window of heaven. If you do, he literally is an if. If you call for the elders, they lay hands on the sick, then they shall recover. So you got to make sure that you have completed your part. Because if you mess up the procedure, case dismissed. Respond in prayer. Watch this. This is the one that's probably going to be the most challenging. Listen. You can't listen and talk. And we are so noise driven that we have to have something around us. Our, our generation to come, I, I feel so bad for them because they got to have some music on and they're doing homework. What is happening here? I need utter si shh. silence. I can't hear God. I'm over here listening for God, and before you know it, I'm like this here. No, be quiet. Why do you think Jesus always stole away? He went to a private, secluded 
place up in the mountains and he would get up before everybody else got up. My mama is the, the epitome of that. My, my mama got up every single day, like 4.30 in the morning to go in her bathroom with her daily bread and her Bible and spend time talking to God with silence so you can hear. And then the last thing is don't end your prayer with amen. <laughs> I told y'all it was going to be that kind of day. That's why y'all, that's why I had y'all praying. <laughs> Don't end your prayer with amen. You say amen. Okay, let me go back and read the word. Because Ellery is looking at me sideways. So. You say amen, and then you go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 18, which is where we started. Rejoice evermore. Watch this. Pray without ceasing. And then what's the third thing? In everything, that's how you end it. You give thanks. You start thanking God for everything that you believe he's already done. You start speaking those things that are not as though they were. You start rejoicing like he's already brought you out of it, brought you through it, brought you over it, bringing you into it. You start thanking God. When I think, I thank. When I think, I thank. And so when I have now spent this time with God, I'm not going to wait. Amen can't be the end for me. I'm going to have to thank God on the level of my expectation and give him glory in advance for everything that he desires. And watch this. He says, and this is the will of God concerned in Christ Jesus concerning you. Don't wait for your neighbor. God, you said... Whatsoever things we ask when we pray, believe that we have the past tense received and we shall have what we say. Every petition that we are making to you right now, we are petitioning the throne of grace. We are coming before the King of Kings, acknowledging that you are the sovereign Lord. We're honoring you with thanksgiving in our hearts. We appreciate you for giving us our daily bread. We thank you for the provision, for the sustaining power, for the sustaining grace. We thank you, oh God, that even as we are being forgiven, we are forgiving. You're giving us grace to forgive those who have hurt us, who have wounded us, who have betrayed us. We thank you, oh God, and we make our own personal supplication and petition to you. You know the things that we need. You said that you would, if we delighted ourselves in you, you would give us the desires of our heart thank you for teaching us what to want thank you for giving us what it is we should desire thank you for showing us your divine process and your procedure and we thank you oh God that your will will be done on this earth even as you have already set it up in heavenly places in the heavenly places God we're already healed in the heavenly places God there's no more sickness and sorrow there's no more suffering in the heavenly places God there's joy unspeakable and full of your glory in the heavenly places there is peace that surpasses all understanding let your kingdom now of this world be subject to the authority of the kingdom of God let every principality that has set itself up against your kingdom let it be torn down let it be uprooted let it be overthrown by the kingdom of your people Lord the kingdom of this world has been become your call your footstool oh God we thank you God for bringing down every stronghold every high place that is going to be laid plain every crooked place that will be made straight we thank you for what you are about to do in our lives in our children in our families in our finances with our relationships in our mind in our joy we thank you in our business we thank you for it for thine is the kingdom. Oh, it all belongs to you, God. And the glory belongs to you. 
not just now, but you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Your glory and your reign shall be forever and ever and ever. Amen. Now you got to not end with amen. You got to end with a shout. Oh, bless your name.